Good morning. Uh, here I'm today just trying to explain to you what we are doing here in the chemistry of metal organic frameworks, that are these lovely uh, materials. So a MOF is a porous molecular material built from the assembly of inorganic nodes and organic linkers in order to produce these beautiful porous architectures. And this family of materials have gained increasing relevance in really sophisticated technological applications as separation, storage, or catalysis, mainly due to two reasons. So first is the unlimited number of chemical structures and tunable compositions we can create by combining these inorganic and organic nodes. And also the ability of these porous buildings to control the arrangement of chemistry of the things we put inside their pores. That's what we call guests. So by playing around with composition structures and gas, we can create really sophisticated applications with this family of materials. And what I'll try to do today is to explain to you how we can produce them in order to access these really sophisticated applications. So I have explained why MOVs are interesting and we want to be working with them, but how do we cook them? How do we prepare them chemically? So for that, we need to take into account that there are main four synthetic variables to try to control the synthesis of MOVs. So the first would be the inorganic part of the framework. The second would be the organic linker. And the third and fourth are obviously linked to the way we combine these organic and inorganic parts. And that would be the solvent we use for the chemistry in solution, and also some auxiliary agents we use to control the crystallization of the MOF, because that is a key point. When we work in MOF chemistry, we want to be producing crystals. So depending on how we combine these four variables, we are going to be able to control the formation of perfectly ordered crystals and also the possibility of repairing defects during their crystallization. So this is where the synthesis of MOFs is typically done, I mean, in a synthetic lab. In just about cooking, I mean, just producing a MOF, it's all about the recipients we combine, how much of each of them we combine, how we mix them, and more importantly, uh, how long do we react them and at which temperature. And for doing that, obviously, we need chemically, chemical setups that are going to be showing you as I'll be introducing specific examples of the synthesis of MOFs. So this can be done the classical way. And we can use these small Teflon reactors for doing the, the synthesis of MOFs. With these, we typically weigh the different components manually. That would be the inorganic salt, the organic linger, solvent, and so on and so forth. Load the reactors, mix them, and then heat them at controlled time and temperatures. Then we can open the reactor and analyze the product that is formed one by one to analyze them separately. This is obviously hard work and certainly not the most effective way to explore the vast chemical space available when trying to synthesize MOFs. So we, and in my group, we are using an alternative approach that relies on the use of synthetic robots like this one. This machine, which is quite expensive, unfortunately, but enables the systematic exploration of the chemical space by automated dosing of solids and liquids. So in this way, we can design multiple reactions at the same time and implement them in rounds of experiments that are then analyzed in parallel by using the corresponding characterization techniques like would be thermal analysis, X-ray diffraction, porosity, and so on. And obviously, this offers multiple advantages when exploring unknown territory for the synthesis of new MOFs. This is what we call high-throughput synthesis of MOFs and is gaining more and more importance nowadays.
After combining the inorganic and organic components and all the reagents we need for producing MOFs, either by using a robot or manually, we obviously need to cook them. And for doing that, we need to put enough energy or temperature so that these components will combine into these beautiful architectures. And for that, we typically use these type of ovens we call solvothermal ovens. So what we typically do is just to, when we introduce the, the reactors in our oven, is to set a given reaction time and play with the ramps of heating and cooling. As we are trying to produce crystals, it is important to control these variables to facilitate the two steps that control the process of crystallization. Those are nucleation and crystal growth. So by playing with the ramps, we can facilitate the formation of many nuclei of crystallization and facilitate their growth. The idea behind these ramps is to produce single crystals of our MOFs that will facilitate their structural analysis and characterization. But are there any other ways to produce MOFs? Do we always need wet chemistry? Do we always need thermal heating? I will just show you how we can do that also without solvents and effective temperature heating. Besides the classical solvothermal approach, we can also produce MOFs without solvents or only with tiny fractions of solvents. And that's quite interesting because this, we, this is going to save us an important fraction of the economic cost of the MOF synthesis and also one of the main contaminants during the synthesis of MOFs, which is the organic solvents we typically need to use for producing. Sometimes the physical reaction of metal precursors and organic linkers in presence of a minimum amount of organic solvents can also enable the formation of crystalline MOFs. This technique, we also call liquid-assisted grinding, relies on the use of this type of equipment. This is an automated ball mill, and we use this uh, just compared to the conventional solvothermal reactions, in this case, uh, we can replace uh, the thermal heating by this mechanical milling process that ensures the energy necessary for the reaction to take place. This offers several advantages, as this approach is faster and allows the use of non-soluble precursors, although it is sometimes also limited by a low rate of production, so it's not the most effective way for producing a high quantity of moth material. I've shown you that there are many different ways to produce MOFs, but there are so many others that I haven't talked about, like would be, for instance, electrochemistry, flow chemistry, uh, you know, supercritical conditions. There are many different ways to produce MOFs. And MOFs and reticular chemistry in general is an emerging field with plenty of opportunities for people to enroll in as biologists, chemical engineers, physicists, chemists, and all of them would have very, very nice opportunities to develop new concepts. I mean, the field is now mature enough to be able to produce very sophisticated applications that are only limited by our own imagination. With close to 90,000 MOF structures produced this far, please believe me, come in, start working with them, because you'll see and will be amazed about the opportunities offered by these new and emerging chemistry of reticular solids.